Thanks, Dustin. That's definitely an exciting vision, and I feel like my topic is a little pedestrian in by comparison. So uh, I'm Doug Weber. I'm in the bioengineering department at the University of Pittsburgh, and my role here is really to help ground the conversation in, in terms of the technology that really underlies uh, the, the concepts and the vision that we're, we're speaking about. Just a little warning, if your stomach is a little uneasy after your heavy lunch, I do have some graphic images uh, on slide three that um, may not agree with you. Uh, I apologize, but they do help me make my point, I hope. So for the last 70 or so years, we've seen a, you know, really a remarkable evolution of neural interface technology um, that started um, with technology being developed to fulfill, fulfill some very uh, important unmet needs. Uh, the cardiac pacemaker was really the, the first uh, device that was uh, developed to interface directly with, in the, that case, the heart, uh, to provide uh, life-saving function, that is, keep the heart beating um, uh, when it was failing. Um, that first technology um, was very crude, uh, but it was the only thing available to, to uh, save uh, these particular patients' lives, and so while crude, uh, it was medically necessary. But over time, uh, over the next uh, several decades, the technology has become uh, much more refined. Uh, it's um, uh, almost elegant uh, in a way. It's, um, it's compact, it's, uh, it's easy to deploy, um, and it's now more widely used. And with the evolution of that technology, we've also seen the evolution of many other technologies that, um, like the pacemaker, were developed uh, initially to serve an unmet medical need and over time have become uh, much more improved in their uh, form and function uh, and are thus uh, easier, easier to use and are being adopted uh, by a much broader audience. So, you know, looking at this list and, and, and thinking through what these various technologies do, we have devices that control cardiac function, we have devices that give us, uh, that give deaf people the ability to hear, we have devices that can control our uh, perception of pain, and we can go on and on down the list and think about, you know, it's great that these devices exist to, to satisfy a medical need, but what if people that were otherwise healthy had access to technology like this? What might they do um, with it? So just to sort of think about and, and help you all appreciate how the technology has evolved over the past, uh, again, 50 to 70 years, I thought I'd use a couple of examples, because it's really, I think, remarkable to appreciate just how much technology has changed uh, in just a few decades' time, and uh, look forward to, to appreciate just where it might be going and how quickly it might be getting there. So I'm using here uh, spinal cord stimulation as my example of uh, neuro neurostimulation technology. Originally, these devices uh, were pretty bulky, right? We had electrode arrays um, that required surgery uh, to implant into the epidural space of the spinal canal. Uh, there were kind of uh, bulky lead wires that, that ran from those electrodes uh, out of the spine uh, into a, a box. Uh, that contained electronics and a battery uh, and some control logic to, to control the operation of that device. And so all told, we're talking about a, a, a total implant size of several cubic uh, centimeters, right? Um, th that's a lot of hardware to put inside the body and you know, I think we would all think twice about whether or not we really want to carry around uh, all that extra uh, cargo. Fast forward uh, a few decades and now modern devices look very different, right? We've eliminated that box. We don't need uh, a battery anymore because we can deliver energy through the skin, okay? We don't need lead wires anymore because we can embed the electronics and the, the sort of logic, control logic for the device right on the electrode itself. Okay, so now that complete system has gone from several cubic centimeters in volume to now just a few millimeters in volume. And at that scale, the technology doesn't need a scalp, you don't need a, a surgeon to place the device. You can, you can use a needle and deliver it uh, as an injectable. Okay, so just a couple of decades of uh, engineering and the technology has gone from something that requires surgery uh, to something that can be injected. Looking ahead, um, other methods for modulating and stimulating neural activity are being developed. Uh, kilohertz frequency uh, stimulation is being used to stimulate the spinal cord uh, through electrodes placed on the skin. So think about that. You know, we're, we're developing technology that can 
focus uh, electrical energy to neural structures that are deep inside the body and uh, no surgery or no skin breakage required. In the same way, ultrasound, high intensity focused ultrasound is being developed as a tool uh, for modulating brain activity and uh, uh, neural, uh, neural structures in other parts of the body. And again, uh, it's an entirely non-invasive technology that can focus energy at deep targets inside the body and control neurological function. Again, no surgery. Looking, um, looking at other areas where uh, technology like this is being used, so we, we talked about the application for pain. Uh, my colleague uh, Lee Fisher at the University of Pittsburgh is developing uh, applications of spinal cord stimulation for the restoration of sensory function in lower limb amputees. And at the outset, really the goal of that project was to, to, was to help amputees be able to feel their prosthetic feet. And there was a little uh, thought given to, to how, you know, what other impact that, that technology may have. And what Lee has found is that in addition to restoring uh, important sensory functions, all of the subjects that he's tested to date have reported a dramatic reduction in their pain scores. Okay, so think about that. So the goal here is to try to uh, strengthen uh, the sensory experience uh, for these amputees. And as a result, um, they're generally feeling uh, better and, and experiencing less pain. So again, unattended consequences, which in this case, I think are very powerful. Okay, so that, that's technology and the evolution of technology for stimulating uh, activity in the nervous system. Uh, there's also been remarkable developments for uh, technology that is used to monitor or record activity throughout the nervous system. And epilepsy is a, a classic case where uh, neural recording technology has evolved over several decades from a form where it is highly invasive. So shown, uh, shown on the left are images from a procedure uh, that involves placement of electrode arrays right on the brain surface. So that's a human brain that you're looking at there. Um, and the panel B in that image shows in a, a blanket of electrodes that allow the, the neurologist and the neurosurgical team to measure the activity inside the brain and identify the location of seizures um, where, they, uh, where they're being driven. And then uh, from that, be able to diagnose and guide uh, surgical procedures for curing or treating that epilepsy. Okay, so that, that's how that procedure, um, that, that's how that procedure has, uh, has worked uh, for several decades. More, a more modern approach, uh, however, is to limit, eliminate that large uh, skull flap and instead uh, use a robot and a very small drill to place needle electrodes through small openings in the skull and uh, provide that same access to monitoring brain activity, but now through a minimally invasive uh, procedure. Okay, so you know, if, if it were up to me, I would certainly rather have uh, a small uh, drill and a, a robot guiding the electrodes than having half of my skull removed. Um, uh, so I would certainly choose option two. Um, but looking ahead, there's new technology um, being developed by a, a group in Australia that eliminates the need for the drill um, uh, altogether. And that technology is called the Stentrode. And what that does is it uses uh, endovascular stents, um, which are used routinely uh, in cardiovascular applications. And by instrumenting those stents with microelectrodes that face out, um, by tunneling such a device into the uh, 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 cavity of the brain, uh, the blood vessels of the brain, and deploying it there, it's possible to measure activity from inside the blood vessels of your brain, thus eliminating the need for, um, for cranial surgery altogether. Okay, so imagine uh, technology like this uh, being used in the future to measure or even uh, modulate activity in the brain um, somewhat easily. Okay, so uh, thus far I've talked mainly about uh, implantable devices, um, but what we're finding, uh, or what we're appreciating more and more is that there are um, really incredible opportunities for interfacing with the nervous system from the, uh, from the surface of the skin itself. So rather than injecting a device or doing a surgery to implant a device, uh, we're finding with devices such as the one shown here, which is what we call a sleeve electrode array uh, developed by a company called Battelle in uh, Columbus, Ohio, 
This is a device that uses an array of 150 sensors, which can be blanketed uh, anywhere on the body, but in this case, uh, we're using it to measure muscle activity in the forearm. And what's significant about this is we're, we're measuring muscle activity from muscles that have been paralyzed by a spinal cord injury. So normally, um, after spinal cord injury, if, if the injury is uh, severe um, and there's a full loss of motor function, you wouldn't expect to find any electrical signals uh, inside. But what we're uh, finding, uh, and uh, shown at the bottom right, is the subject uh, used in the, uh, in the video that, that's being shown here. Uh, his name's Ian, he's actually in the audience, uh, so you can talk to him after. But what we, what we found uh, in the arm of Ian uh, and in uh, the arms of our other subjects that have a, a similar injury is that there is uh, electrical activity that can still be detected. And with the right hardware, we can measure that activity and use it to control assistive devices. Okay, so now we've eliminated the need for surgery altogether, and this neuroprosthetic technology becomes something more akin to a garment, like your shirt that you put on in the morning, and can monitor and control uh, devices that assist your functions throughout the day. Okay, so again, looking to the future, I think there's real opportunity for uh, technologies like this. Okay, so just to wrap up, you know, I, the, the, really the, the, the point here is to highlight that you know, in the beginning it was really all about satisfying medical needs, um, providing hope for uh, people with uh, diseases that couldn't be treated uh, by, in any other way. Um, and in, in, in fact, uh, for many years, or uh, in many cases, devices are still seen uh, by many as treatments of last resort. That is, people will try, uh, patients and physicians will wanna try uh, medication and therapy and, and many other things before they resort um, two devices uh, when in fact uh, in many uh, cases the devices I think provide the greatest hope. What we've seen uh, through engineering refinement is that modern devices are, are very small um, and easily delivered uh, to the parts of the body where they're needed uh, and in doing so they've become safer, uh, more effective and I think uh, importantly have greatly expanded access uh, uh, to them. Uh, injectable and wearable devices are, uh, are happening. Um, you know, it, there's uh, many new um, uh, recent examples of devices that can be uh, injected even to deep parts of the brain, including, or deep parts of the body, including the brain. And I think as that trend continues, uh, we will see greater expansion of the, the use cases. Um, and again, the point, uh, one of the main points is that we're no longer thinking only about the medical applications of this technology. We're already seeing uh, cases where some of the very ty same types of sort of engineered devices are being applied to consumer applications. Uh, and you may recognize uh, some of the labels on this slide. Uh, you know, I think it's really significant to, to know that the things that you know, a decade ago were restricted to uh, rehab um, are now being used to play video games uh, and uh, enhance your cognitive and physical performance. So thank you. Thank you.